This episode is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Use cardkingdom.com slash studies to pick up some magic cards and ask for a custom food token at your next checkout. And now for a story. In the winter of 1808, Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm set off into the dark woods of central Germany in search of the tales that sustained the peasantry through the cold nights along the brutal countryside. Or so the story goes. Nun, liebe Kinder, gebt fein ach. Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel and the girl Gretel. This is the story of Hansel and Gretel. It is also the story of the brothers Grimm, philologists and successful scholars of the University of Marburg, whose efforts to collect the fairy tales we've grown up with in the West was motivated by both poverty and a desire to unify a fragmented country. My tale is a frame within a frame, much like the magic card that inspired it. Now, into the dark wood, where starvation has led a poor woodcutter and his wife to abandon their children. Early tomorrow morning we will take the children out into the forest to where it is the thickest. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them. Having overheard his stepmother scheming the night prior, Hansel brought along with him a gathering of pebbles from the pathway in front of their home. And while the woodcutter led his children deeper into the forest, Hansel left an inconspicuous trail of stones to mark their way back. And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand and followed the pebbles, which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. Resourcefulness is a key motif in the grim fairy tales. The children in these stories, when placed in mortal peril, are predisposed to survival. They are wiser than their years, perhaps serving as models to follow for the kids who listened along to their adventures. But the first version of Children's and Household Tales, published in 1812, was never meant for a young audience. Far more violent and gruesome, this edition consisted of 86 tales that the brothers had begun collecting when they were still teenagers in university. Their goal was to preserve the oral storytelling tradition of the Volk in the name of cultural heritage. The family still had no bread to share with the children, so back into the woods they were led, to be abandoned, and to starve. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest, where they had never in their lives been before. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house, and if help did not come soon, they must die of hunger and weariness. After three days in the forest, the children stumbled upon a curiosity tucked deep into the wood, where magic is always allowed to blend with the real. And when they approached the little house, they saw that it was built of bread, covered with cakes, but that the windows were of clear sugar. A house made of gingerbread, adorned with candies, alluring, and the perfect treat to satiate their famine. So brings us to Curious Pear. Every element of this magic card has a role in fulfilling the telling and retelling of Hansel and Gretel. Here we are at the height of dramatic tension, observing the hungry and lost children as they approach the enchanted house in the woods. Significantly, we take the perspective of the malevolent witch, peering out the window of the house that was conjured as a trap for children. And Hansel and Gretel have fallen right into it. The old woman had only pretended to be so kind. She was, in reality, a wicked witch, who lay in wait for children and had only built the little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked, and ate it, and that was a feast day with her. Food and eating are the driving elements of this fairy tale, for it was hunger and a lack of means to provide for it that forced the woodcutter to abandon his children in the woods. And it was hunger that led Hansel and Gretel to this gingerbread house, and it was hunger that possessed the witch to consume the young wanderers. It was also hunger that pushed the Grimm brothers themselves to publish their collection of folk tales. In 1796, when the boys were still adolescents, 
their father died, plunging their middle-class family into poverty. Ten years later, their mother died too, leaving the brothers responsible for three younger siblings. They were poor and hungry. And so were the Germans of the early 14th century who laid the foundation for the story of Hansel and Gretel. Between 1315 and 1317, all of Europe fell into a terrible famine, dropping the average life expectancy to roughly 30 years old and resulting in vicious crimes like infanticide and cannibalism. People were starving. Another fairy tale in the first Grimm collection called Children of the Famine begins this way, and it was later axed for being too gruesome. Once upon a time, there was a woman with two daughters, and they'd become so poor that they no longer even had a piece of bread to put in their mouths. Their hunger was so great that their mother became unhinged and desperate. Indeed, she said to her children, I've got to kill you so that I can get something to eat. Curious Pear lets us produce a food token. In Throne of Eldraine, much like in the Grimm fairy tales, food can be a source of energy and sustenance. Players can sacrifice food to gain life, effectively eating the morsels that certain cards cook up. Like Hansel and Gretel chomping their way through the gingerbread house, food can be bountiful, a source of great pleasure. It's gingerbread like mother makes, reads the flavor text, reminding the readers of the warmth that accompanies a homemade meal. What is there to be afraid of? What is to fear, the story suggests, is the use of food as a weapon. Tempting witch, via her poisoned apples, forces opponents to lose life, effectively transforming these same morsels into ammunition. The weaponization of food surfaces as a fear tactic every year during Halloween. So many are the articles published about razors hidden in caramel apples and edibles disguised as sour gummies in order to attack innocent trick-or-treaters. The pleasure and innocence of eating, in this way, is instead used for malevolence. And finally, when food is lacking, players become famished. Without food, your gilded goose cannot produce. The savvy hunter's trips into the woods yield no game. The Troll King cannot feast if there is nothing to eat. And neither can the witch, who has now captured Hansel and Gretel with nothing more than food. She, too, is starving and needs to feed. In fact, treats to share, as is creating the gingerbread house used to tempt the children. In both the adventure and in the art, we assume the role of the witch. We capture the children and prepare the oven, readying it to sacrifice the kids for food. But the story here takes its turn for the better, showcasing again the resourcefulness of the children in the grim tales, as well as the traditional happy ending that became synonymous with the genre. Then Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it, and shut the iron door, and fastened the bolt. Oh, then she began to howl quite horribly, but Gretel ran away, and the godless witch was miserably burnt to death. Escaping from the gingerbread house, Hansel and Gretel made their way back home, to their father, who had been in agony since their departure. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left the children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead. Then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. When we were young, the grim fairy tales always felt ineffectual. How fun it was to imagine Gretel shoving the witch into the furnace and freeing Hansel, then robbing the witch of her treasure as to live happily ever after with their father back home. We listened along to these tales and saw ourselves in the children, the heroes of the stories. As we grow older and revisit the folklore, though, we better understand the gravity of this world. We sense the terrific consequences that hunger can inflict upon the peasants of the countryside. We grasp at the weights that the poor woodcutter must feel when forced to abandon his children in the woods, out of failure to provide food for their survival. The film adaptation of Stephen King's The Mist really puts a decision like this into perspective, a choice between self and family, and how heavily that can weigh on the head of the household. It is in this showcase version of Curious Pair where I feel all of these themes merge into one perfect magic card, where the wicked hands of a starving witch reach out towards her prey who are innocently approaching to sneak a bite to eat. Here, the pleasure of eating leads directly to death. The most primal necessity of sustenance is used perversely to end life, where a food token is made and a human peasant soon follows suit. Here, the real effects of starvation are felt in a much different, much less jovial way. 
The Grimm brothers were eventually rewarded with honorary doctorate degrees for their work in transcribing these tales. In the introduction of the first edition, they commented on the power of stories and the necessity to conserve them. It was perhaps just the right time to record these tales, since those people who should be preserving them are becoming more and more scarce. They take pleasure in them without having any reason. This is exactly why the custom of storytelling is so marvelous. In doing so, they brought heavy criticism for turning into literature a once exclusively oral tradition. They then rewrote the plots of these stories in later editions, rendering them much more suitable for a childhood audience. Adding illustrations was paramount to this process. We must remember too that they did not traverse the dark woods to collect their material, as the romantic image of the outlandish Grimm brothers had led us to believe. They were scholars who wrote stories from the comfort of their desks. And these stories became focused on teaching moral lessons and providing examples for how to behave in an idealized, unified German society. In Professor Jack Zipes' words, the literary fairy tale in Germany became dominant before industry was fully developed, and when the people, largely influenced by agrarian lifestyles and patriarchal authoritarianism, were striving for a type of familial unification. The fascists and the Nazis would later utilize the Grimm brothers' tales as nationalist propaganda for exactly those reasons. Children's and household tales has since become the second most popular piece of literature in Germany, set just behind the Bible. And Disney has of course capitalized on the reinterpretation of these stories too, rendering still the morals clearer and violence minute. Magic now joins in this tradition of telling and retelling these tales. Through cards like Curious Pear, we can experience the archetypes of fairy tales, albeit in the much more narrow medium that is card text, visual art, and game mechanics. What remains throughout all of these iterations, though, is at the heart of Jakob and Wilhelm's Hansel and Gretel. That is, what becomes of the human animal when gone without its most basic needs? When it is hungry? When it is starving? When it is desperate? For food? <laughs>